Hello again. Since earlier this, in this year, we've been uh, embarking on a series of sermons called Habits of the Healthy Soul. And the early sermons are on our, our SoundCloud audio page. And then the more recently, the, the more recent sermons subsequent to COVID-19, uh, they're on YouTube, where you're probably watching this. But up to now, those sermons of Habits of the Healthy Soul have been quite general about the importance of healthy souls for ourselves and for others. But beginning today and in the weeks ahead, I want us to turn to look at some of the specific habits that we can cultivate uh, for the health of our souls. And today I want to think for a few minutes about the practice of celebration. Now, When you think of spiritual disciplines, or as John Wesley called them, the means of grace, you may immediately think of prayer, Bible study, fasting, and stuff like that. And we'll get to those. But as I say, I want to start with celebration. Now, you may not think of that at all as a spiritual discipline or or anything really to do with your soul. And also, you might think it's a bit of a strange thing to be talking about during these days of lockdown with COVID-19. So why is celebration important for our spiritual health? Well, the first, and I guess the fundamental answer to that question, is because joy is at the heart of God himself. And because of that, joy is at the heart of God's plans for human beings. Joy is absolutely basic to God's character. We see that right from the very beginning of the Bible, when in the first chapter it's really clear that God enjoyed creation. And all through that account, uh, he said, you know, it's good. And, And right at the end, it's very good. And then move on a bit. For example, listen to Psalm 19 verse 5, which speaks of the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy. And like a strong man, runs its course with joy. That's just one example. There's lots more verses in the Bible which describe creation as expressing God's own unwearying joy at simply being. Often that's expressed in the language of nature. For example, well-known verse Isaiah 55 verse 12. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you. The trees of the fields will clap their hands. Every created thing praises the Lord. For example, in Psalm 148, we read, picking up at verse 7, Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. One of the wonderful consequences of preaching outside, as I've been, do- as I'm doing now, and been doing over recent weeks, is that sometimes during sermons you'll hear the birds in the background, and they're celebrating God, singing their celebration. And it's not just the Old Testament. Much later in the New Testament, in John 15 verse 11, Jesus said to his followers. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. So God is total joy and he wants us to know joy. In contrast to that, Uh, Francis de Salle, who was the Bishop of Geneva 400 years ago, wrote this, The evil one, the devil, is pleased with sadness and melancholy because he himself is sad and melancholy and will be so for all eternity. Hence, he desires that everyone should be just like himself, (laughs) but not God. God is total joy and God wants us to know joy in our lives. So here's the thing. If that's true, if, as I've just said, joy is God's basic character, then the more we allow joy into our lives, the more we allow God into our lives. You know, in Deuteronomy 14, verse 22, God told his people to have a big celebration each year at the harvest. 
It says, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine and olive oil, and the firstborn of your her herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name. So they were to enjoy, enjoy a feast. But then note at the end of verse 23, the purpose of all this, it was so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. So it's another hint that joy is God's basic character. And the more we allow joy into our lives, the more we allow God into our lives. At the time to begin pursuing joy in our lives isn't some time in the future. The time to begin pursuing joy in our lives is now. As Psalm 118 verse 24 puts it, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's not talking about yesterday or about tomorrow. It's talking about now. You see, sometimes we think that, ah, you know, joy is something that will come someday. It'll come when things improve or when there are changes in my life. Maybe at the moment we think, well, joy will come when the lockdown's over. Or sometimes if we're at school, we might think, well, joy will come when, when, when I'm finished school or, or if, we're, if we're, we're, we're single we might be convinced that joy will happen when we get married or if we're married we might think that joy will happen when we've got children or if we've got children we might think that we'll be happy when they finally grow up and leave the nest or whatever whatever but joy is not something to wait for every day is a day to look out for and to find windows of joy you see Today is the day that God has given you life. Today is the day that your heart is beating. Today is the day that you have breath. Today is the day you had breakfast. Today is the day that Christ died for you. Today is the day that Christ is risen and alive. Joy. And yet maybe you're thinking, but there's so much suffering. My life is hard. All this stuff's going on just now. And yet, you know, it's a fact of history that very often the people closest to suffering have the most powerful joy in their hearts. You may have heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German pastor imprisoned by the Nazis. One of the English army officers imprisoned with him wrote this afterwards. Bonhoeffer always seemed to me to spread an atmosphere of happiness and joy over the least incident and profound gratitude for the mere fact that he was alive. So, as John Ortberg puts it, true joy, as it turns out, comes only to those who've devoted their lives to something greater than personal happiness. And this is most visible in, in the extraordinary lives of some of the saints and mar martyrs, but it's no less true for ordinary people like us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer himself who have just mentioned, he wrote this, God cannot endure that unfestive, mirthless attitude of ours in which we eat our bread in sorrow with pretentious, busy haste or even with shame. Through our daily meals, he is calling us to rejoice, to keep holiday in the midst of our working day. So Bonhoeffer there is kind of saying, something as simple as eating your lunch, let that be a, a moment of joy and thankfulness to God for his provision for each of us. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 18, Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circum circumstances. Now it doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. It says give thanks in all circumstances. So, the discipline of celebration is firstly about giving thanks to God whenever something good happens or whenever we enjoy even the, the slightest moment of our day. At that moment, take time to experience and savour the joy of that moment and to direct our thoughts to God at that moment, to involve God in the celebration. So, even now, if you want to pause this video, just take a moment to ask yourselves, what are some of the natural joyful moments that occur in my day that I need to begin noticing and celebrating with God? 
And then secondly, as well as noticing the joyful moments that are already there, it's a good idea to look for ways to put some more of them into our day. If you're under crazy time pressure and work, then try and take five minutes during your coffee break and just take that time to savour and relax in God's presence, rejoicing in Him and giving thanks for the little break that you've got from the pressure of work. Or if it's the opposite for you, if you're stuck at home and really bored and locked down, then actively seek to punctuate your day with moments that bring you joy. I don't know what those would be for you. Uh, for example, Maybe take five minutes to, to look out the window, up at the sky, and enjoy the vastness of the universe. And remember that you're not alone. Or take a moment to look out the window at a, at a tree, or, or a bird flying by, or a plant with a beautiful flower. And again, just take that moment to enjoy it with God. Or take some time to just sit and relax with a book that you like. But again, a moment of joy, and then bring God into that celebration. It's a really good question to ask. What are some of the practical things that I can do to seek joy on a more regular basis throughout my day, no matter what else is happening? And then another really important question to ask is this. What are the unchangeable and eternal gifts that God has given you that no one can ever take away? Because these can be a source of joy, even when times are tough. That's why, you know, you ever noticed all through the New Testament, there's a theme of joy? Even though at that time, the early Christians lived in persecution, they lived under pressure, there were all kinds of tensions, they were a tiny vulnerable group in the middle of a huge and powerful empire. But in that context, they viewed everything in the light of the resurrection and the ultimate triumph of Christ. They knew that that was unshakable, even as their immediate fortunes kind of came and went. Dallas Willard is another writer who notes that celebration is often overlooked as a spiritual discipline. And yet, he describes celebration as the completion of worship, for it dwells on the greatness of God and that's shown in God's goodness to us. And so Willard writes, We engage in celebration when we enjoy ourselves, our life, our world, in conjunction with our faith and confidence in God's greatness, goodness and beauty. We concentrate on our life and world as God's work and as God's gift to us. I love that. We engage in celebration when we enjoy ourselves and our life and our world in conjunction with our faith and our confidence in God's greatness, goodness and beauty. We concentrate on our life and our world as God's work and as God's gift to us. A healthy faith before God can't be built and maintained without heartfelt celebration of his goodness to us in the midst of the difficult things which life also brings. I think that's what it means in Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 4 when it says there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance and celebrate. Only by celebration can we really begin to understand how great and lovely God is and how good he has been to us. Celebration puts our problems and our sorrows into balance, into perspective, and it strengthens us in following God because His goodness becomes increasingly real to us. So let me finish now uh, by reading Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. But as I read those words, and you maybe know them already, remember that the Apostle Paul wrote those words while he was in captivity, under armed guard, waiting for trial before the Roman Emperor. And in that context, he said, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, I'm hoping to return to this theme next week, but in the meantime, it's a really good question to ask. What are some of the practical things that I can seek, that I can do to seek joy on a more regular basis throughout my day? 
Joy is basic to God's character. And the more we allow joy into our lives, the more we allow God into our lives. Let's practice the discipline of celebration. Amen.